We've started recording. Okay, let's start with digitizing our drawings today. And we're gonna start with grabbing Adobe for free. Okay. <sighs> Whenever, right? That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Front row seat, that's what I want. That's right, anyway. Um, so the first thing that I like to do um, always is to go to our website when I want to do a search rather than searching through Google. So I know other ways to get through to get to stuff, but I just want to, like, I, this should be your default place to go. Like if you need to look up academic calendar, if you need an advising form, if you need anything like that, I recommend going on the university website and using its search function because that'll give you the most up-to-date version of that PDF, that policy, any of that stuff, okay? The only exception to this is the syllabus that your faculty member shares with you at the beginning of the semester. But more and more in those syllabi are links to the university policy so that everything is always up-to-date. Because um, what you don't want, what you don't want is an advising form from three years ago, okay? Um, that's not a problem for you right now, but it might be a problem for you when you're a junior and you go back in your email to look at an advising form that's changed. Okay, so uh, software available to users. We're gonna click on that. Okay, here's the infamous computer requirements, but that's, you can see it's for industrial design, not for um, CABE. Okay, so this is through the, we're now on the library's website and here is um, the software that's available. now. Just because it's available doesn't mean that you should download it, okay? Some of these are quite large, okay? But we are interested in Adobe, so here it is. Jefferson.edu backslash Adobe. So literally, it just I just searched for it. It's the first return from the Scott Memorial Library. It'll be on this video if you need to check it out later. And this gets you to, again, Jefferson.edu backslash Adobe. Now this is key. There's there's a lot of different ways to get Adobe products. One is to buy a monthly subscription. Don't do that. One is to sign up for the student monthly subscription. Don't do that. Which is it's cheaper, but don't do that because Jefferson University already has an agreement with Adobe that all of its students get to use Adobe for free. So you get to, oh, thank you. You get to use that for free, but only if you go in this way. If you sign up, I'm gonna make an agreement between you and Adobe. Um, I can't give you a refund because you're, you know, you're contracting with them independently on your own. Okay, so here's the login to download it. Um, and it gives you a set of instructions right here, right? So you use your campus key. You have to verify that you're a student, that you have good standing with the university. You go through this and it's gonna show you all that stuff. And if you have a problem, you can literally either call the help desk, but, but there's nothing wrong with going to the help desk in the lower level of Gutman Library and asking for you know assistance in installing it. There's nothing wrong with doing that. If you do that at the beginning of the semester, you'll drive them nuts. But if you do it like now, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. So um, matter of fact, if you have work study, working at the computer help desk is a really sweet gig because uh, they're really friendly people behind this help desk. You wouldn't know that by the telephone, but that's mostly because all of us hate talking on the phone. Um, but also the student workers down there are really, really handy and they have excellent bosses. I know, I get to interact with them a lot. They're, they're super great people. Okay, so once you get your Adobe Creative Cloud license, you get access to, now Adobe has a ton of applications. The three that you need, the three that you need, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign. You don't need any other ones, okay? Now, you might wanna download the video editing software because you think it's cool. If you wanna do that, knock yourself out, but it's a really large program. So, and if you don't have any of those right now, don't download them right now. It'll take the rest of the class to get it downloaded. Um, Photoshop is the original kind of 
OG uh, photo editing software. It is hands down the best editing software. It's been around for the longest. Everything that you do on your phone, whether it is a Droid or an iOS device, uh, is basically a simplified version of what you can do in Photoshop. But in Photoshop, you can do it better, faster, and with more control. And I'm gonna show you guys a little bit of how to do that today. So we practiced earlier this semester using the editing, um, the ability to edit on our phone to take photographs, to kind of focus ourselves when we're in a space to try to like focus on design in terms of the senses, texture, light, and shadow. We also have used those editing softwares that exist already natively on our phone to make our drawings look better. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a raw picture from our phone. We're gonna take it into Adobe. And I'm gonna show you guys not just how you can make it look better, but how you can augment it and do other things with it. So today is gonna be a very much like a how-to session, all right? And I already have a tutorial of this posted online. I think I may have shared it with you before, but I'll share it with you again. It's a lot shorter. It's about 20 minutes. And I basically explain the same thing three different times, each time in a slightly different way. So if, it, if this today is too long, you can watch that and it's shorter. And you can go back and forth. In. Okay. So now that I have this, I'm going to open up Photoshop. So this is Photoshop on my computer. Um, I have, a, I'm going to move my, the picture of me over. Okay. I have it set up so that all these buttons are really tiny. Right? I want to be on this TV in this space so that you guys can see it. Normally these buttons are much larger, but that encroaches on the space that I have to view my image. So this is the menu that I have over here. Oh, wow. You can't even see it on this TV. Hang on. Let's make this a little bit smaller. There you go. Uh, let's just size this appropriately for the television that we're working on. Yoink. There we go. That's a little bit better. All right. So who's used Photoshop before? Don't do it. If you don't have it downloaded right now, don't download it right now. Just kind of, just kind of follow along and watch it. Um, okay. Who's used Photoshop before? Cool. All right. Who's used Illustrator before? All right. They're kind of like, they're kind of different. They're different animals, right? Like they, they look similar. They, they share the same interface. I start by tell, showing people Photoshop because if you understand the interface of Photoshop, it's kind of the gateway to all the other Adobe things. Um, the, I also like starting with this rather than AutoCAD because it'll literally tell you what it is. So check this out. If you hover over a tool, it'll tell you what it is. All right. So there's the move tool. There's the rectangular marquee tool. And can you guys see that it has next to it as I hover over it? Right, right. Polygonal lasso. You see how it has it in parentheses? So if you hover over it, it'll tell you the name of the tool and it'll put this letter in parentheses. That letter is the shortcut to using that tool. So um, it's weird, but oftentimes when I'm working, I've memorized it in my hand, but I, I don't actually, I'm not like, oh, lasso is L. Um, I'm bad at remembering that kind of stuff. So here's, this is called the magic wand tool. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So we're going to use magic wand. Magic wand is like a, magic wand is like kind of like a, a superpower that you can use for evil or for good. This is very important. Uh, Magic Wand is, in my opinion, the most powerful tool in Photoshop. Actually, I think it's the most powerful tool in all of Adobe. This is not to be confused with the Magic Wand that's on your iPhone. But Magic Wand gets abused by tons of people, okay? So uh, imagine, that you, imagine that your car could go as fast as you wanted it to. You would never get pulled over, and you can magically move around traffic. Uh, I think you guys can understand that like lots of people would use that power to drive as fast as possible all the time, not necessarily to like find people that need to get someplace in an emergency and get them. There. So magic wand, superpower tool gets abused. I'm going to show you how to use it the right way. Who's watched Spider-Man? Any of the Spider-Man movies, none of the Spider-Man movies, none. Do yourself a favor. Okay. 
Anybody know anybody know this phrase from Super from Spider Man? With great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. All right. So with great power comes great responsibility. That's the phrase for the magic wand. Magic wand is the Spider Man tool. All right. There's always, always multiple ways to do the same thing in a computer program. So you can go through the menu to do stuff. You can go through the drop down menus to do stuff. And you can use keyboard. There's no reason for me to really go over and make you memorize what the keyboard shortcuts are. I'm just going to show you where they exist. So for example, check this out. One of the ones that I use all the time is called levels. And you can see right here, control L. You don't even need to remember it. It literally tells you what it is right there. So for example, if I click on this, right, we'll get this dialog box over here. Looks like that. And I can hit escape and it goes away. But if I hold control and L, it comes back, right? So this is really important because if you've done any kind of coding or if you've done AutoCAD, the fastest way to work in most computer programs is the keyboard shortcuts. But the problem with keyboard shortcuts is that there's so many variations of them that it's really hard to memorize all of them. And you, so you don't memorize them by sitting down and memorizing them. You memorize them by kind of understanding what the tool wants to do, kind of how it works, or how you might ask a question of it. And then you use it with enough frequency. I gotta tell you, it took me a long time, probably too long, to realize that uh, it was literally telling me that I could resize the image by holding down Alt, Control, and I. And it was telling me right there. Like, I kind of memorized like where it was on the screen, not necessarily you know, the, the keyboard control. I use all three ways to use. Um, so I use, I use keyboard shortcuts all the time. I use the menu interface over here a lot. And I use the drop-down menus a lot as well. There's a fourth way, um, a fourth way where you can create your own macro, which basically means you can kind of create your own personalized tool. Like you can set up your graphic user interface to be the way you want it to be. And you can set it to do your own things. That's one of the reasons why we want you to have your own computer so you can have the settings set up the way you want to have them. But when I teach stuff, I always, the only thing I have changed on my screen is the size of the icon so that I have more working space on my laptop. Um, I don't change anything because I want to be able to sit down at any computer on this campus and use it. And if I specialize this too much, I'm going to forget how to use it. So I'm going to sit down, like my computer crashes, I go to a lab. And I need to use that lab. I'm like, oh crap, where's that button? Because I put the special button in the special Andrew box. So, okay, so the first thing we're going to do, um, we have this image of these drawings, all right? So I think you guys can see these drawings were pinned up in search. Um, they're floor plans of falling water that were done by a student. Uh, this is a file that's been provided by the student. So let's let's look first of all at some of the things that the student has done to make this a very usable image, all right? Number one, they are pinned up flat on the wall. You can see they've already been pinned up nice and flat. There's no curls. They're pinned down. They're evenly lit. And this is incredibly important. We've already done this. You can't, you don't want to take a picture of something in direct sunlight. You don't want to take a picture of something like on your desk where there's only one single lamp that is lighting it up. You want to take the picture, right? We have Lydia's sketchbook right here, right? So we're going to hold it. Thus, we're going to hold the phone nice and parallel to it. We're going to put it on a flat surface with relatively even, even lighting around us. Some of the best lighting that you can take pictures of stuff on campus is in search hall at the halfway point between those two horizontal rows of fluorescent lights. If you take it directly under the fluorescent light, and I'm directly under the fluorescent light, for the fluorescent light upstairs, up here right now, I'm gonna cast a shadow onto my drawing. You don't want that. If I have it up against the wall and there's a light shining on it, wait, wait. It's gonna, there's gonna be a hot spot on it. So it's gonna be brighter. And you guys are gonna see those impacts here um, really shortly. So the only thing wrong with this image is that it's pinned up to the wall. There's good light on the wall, 
But if you guys have noticed, when you pin something up to the wall in search, things are brighter at the top than they are at the bottom. I'm gonna show that to you right now. All right, so let's go to adjustments and levels. Now this is a pictogram that basically shows what the pixels are. So as we look across this, these are all the pixels. I'm gonna move this over so that it captures. There we go. Okay, these are all the pixels, pixels that are truly black. These are all the pixels that are truly white. And these are all the pixels in between that are gradations in value between white and black. Approximately 256 variations. Um, there is no zero, so it's 255. Um, this includes color in here as well, but it only includes the value level of the color. So it doesn't actually like, include like how, how green or how red it is. So let me just pull these around. And as I do, you're gonna dynamically see it change on the screen. So check this out. What I'm gonna do is the more I move this up, the more it says, okay, any, any pixels that are darker than this pixel, treat them as if they're 100% black, okay? So you're gonna see it darkens the overall image. And now, can you see as I do that, do you see how it becomes brighter at the top and really shadowed down here? That's because the light is predominantly coming from the top of the image. It's barely perceptible when we see it here, okay? And actually, to your eye, your eye is a much more sophisticated camera than the camera that's taking this picture. So your eye dynamically adjusts for it in real time, and you don't see the gradation. Now, watch, we can do this too over here. So I can do the same thing, and this says, okay, treat every picture 100%. In a regular photograph, we can allow this to basically kind of increase the contrast, like make the darks darker and make the highlights lighter. But in a drawing, and this is really important, a picture of a drawing is a very different animal because your camera is always trying to look for what's called 50% gray. That's that middle tab right there is 50% gray. And a good picture, a good picture generally has a good, kind of stable amount of 50% gray. It allows us to like feel anchored by the shadows and kind of brings our attention to the highlights, but we get the most information from 50% gray. But check it out, a drawing with pencil lines is majority, like it's like 99% white pixels, you know, 1% really dark gray pixels, but it's like maybe 0.5% really dark gray pixels. And then there's like, construction lines and five line weights in there. So can you guys see how, check this out. If I take a, if I take a paintbrush, let me cancel this. If I take a paintbrush and just brush in here, do you guys see how, like you've been seeing that as white, but it's not white, it's gray. Because the camera is like, oh, I know what that is. That's 50% gray. And I'm like, no, it's not, right? Like we know that that's a white sheet of paper and we see it that way. So you actually have to kind of teach the computer where that's at. All right, so let me back up. Oh, by the way, another thing that I love about Photoshop right here, history, it's in window. I'm gonna go down, history right here. Literally shows you everything that you did and you can back up. Um, you can back up about, depending on your copy of, of Adobe, old ones could only back up about 50 steps. Now you can back up, I think, ever since you've opened the file. If you save and close the file, the history goes away. The history is just kept for that session. But uh, I like it because you can do fun animations of like what you did all, all, all class long. Okay, so let's go back to levels, control L. Sorry, this is the longest, most boring part of the explanation just because you guys haven't really seen this before. Okay, so I can monkey around with these and just kind of get it the way I like it. Now, let's contrast these two, right? This is the brighter one. This is the darker one. Um, so I have a couple of choices here. So I can kind of mess around with these to try to get them as bright as possible. Now, do you guys see how I like to take everything, right? So, so if it starts to make sense, take it all the way to the extreme. You see how it starts to break over here? It starts to become yellow. So 
remember I said that it just counts the value, not necessarily the color parameters. So as we're moving this around, these pixels actually have a component of pink and yellow to them. And as we make it more extreme, they kind of yell louder. So the first thing I'm going to do, since this is a grayscale drawing, is I'm going to change its, I'm going to get rid of all of the color information. Now, one way I can do this is by changing it to a black and white drawing, but you're going to see that that doesn't work really well. So let's, let's do this. We'll do a grayscale drawing. And we're going to discard all the color information. Okay, it doesn't really change it that much. I'm going to back up. We could also wow, they even, it's so useless that they really don't do this anymore. So here's a black and white drawing. Okay, so that makes it black and white. It doesn't look like it's changed it very much, but you'll see once we start pushing around that it does change it. So instead, what I'm gonna do in here, go into adjustments, hue saturation. I'm gonna take all the saturation away. So if I bring the saturation up, you can see, so check it out. Here it is, look, we can actually see the hot spot in the drawing. So the pink is the hot spot. The yellow is the mid range of that light. And the blue is the shadow over here. You can also see how it starts to get weird and pixelated, right? Now we would never present the image this way, but it helps us understand what's going on in that file. All right, a good picture would basically, the entire thing would be pink and there'd be kind of like a yellow blue fringe around the edges if we take it. Which is why I like to take pictures of drawings straight down flat on the tabletop rather than up against the wall. Because usually up against the wall, even if you're getting, even if there's no lights on, you're getting more reflection from the ceiling than from the floor. All right, so instead, I'm gonna take the saturation down to zero, just like you guys did on your iPhones. Say okay. I'm gonna open levels up again. Now we can do a lot of editing with levels. But if we push it too far, you, you can always take data away from a file, but you can't really add it back. With AI, you can kind of add it back, but it's always guessing, okay? So have you guys seen on the AI, like the fact that they're like, here, check out this image. What would the rest of the image look like? And then like the AI kind of paints it. That's pretty cool. It's pretty cool, but it's always guessing. It's never really the way that it is. So I want you to be in charge of being the author of how this drawing comes across. Okay, so we can kind of manually move this around and we can even move this mid-range around. So we can adjust where the whitest whites are and the darkest blacks, and we can adjust where the grayscale is. And you can see that really what's important is to have a balance between all those three set points. But there's another thing that we need to be aware of. Do you guys see how this upper image and the lower image are just reacting differently? Like we're getting a lot of texture in the lower image down here. Let me do it louder. See that texture that we're getting? So rather than trying to edit all four of these at once, you would be much better served to break them down and just do this one, then this one, then this one. And now that's frustrating because it's like, come on, Andrew, it's way faster to do all four at once. Actually, it's not because what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a crappy version of each of the four that kind of like sacrifices quality. It'll be a lot faster to just do one. Also, you can see that for these elevations down here, the line weights are a lot darker and there's way more line weights up here. So before we do levels, what I'm gonna do is grab this marquee and I'm gonna grab just this drawing, control copy and then new. So we're just going to open a new file. And we're going to say that the resolution is 150. And we're going to do it in inches. 24, 17. Hello, there we go. Um, and say okay. Now you can see there was an option there to do it in grayscale. I'm keeping this in color. And I'm pasting in the image. Okay. So here's the image right here. So we just pasted in that image, only that image, not the other stuff. Um, when I grab a hold of it here, you can see I get these toggles. And if I hold shift, I can adjust it and it keeps its proportions. Let me talk about that one more time. If I grab this corner, I can change it, but you can see I'm squishing it. So I lose what the scale is. I'm gonna hit escape to get back. If I hold down shift, 
it locks the proportions into place. So I'm changing the size of this image. But wait, this is Photoshop, so there's different ways I can do it. So I could click on it up here, and I could say edit, transform, scale, and I could do it that way. I don't know whether you guys can see, but like up here, there's these little length and width. And I can say, make it 75% of what it was, 75%, and lock these two together. So there it is, 75% of what it was. I'm going to go with that. It says, do you really want to apply this transformation? And the reason why it's asking you is because by making, by shrinking it, it's going to delete some data. It's going to get rid of some pixels. In this scenario, that's good for me because what I really want is to have this image with some white space around it so that I can edit it. I'm gonna cut out some of the noise here. Uh, if we zoom in, I'm gonna hold down alternate and use my mouse wheel. If we zoom in, can you guys see there's like the pin and you can see the pin up board. So we're gonna clean that off, right? Like rather than trying to edit that data right now, let's just get rid of it. So control X. All right. Now, since I'm teaching you guys how to do this, we're gonna use layers. And this is why we've done the drawings the way that we've done them so far. You guys already know how layers work because you've made a drawing manually that's full of a bunch of layers. So layers are down here in the lower right hand corner. I'm gonna right click on it and say duplicate layer. So this now means I have two copies. Now, do yourself a favor. It's gonna automatically say layer one copy. Now check this out. This can get really redundant. Layer one copy two. Um, then I can do, then I can duplicate this layer, layer copy three. You guys see how it, it keeps naming them kind of dumbly? Let's put some power in. It's going to keep naming them uh, and it's frustrating. So instead, let's just rename them. So when I make a layer, I'll just delete this guy again too. Delete layer. Yes. Okay. So let's rename this. There we go. Double click. Original drawing. Gray. OK. We're just going to put a little bit of a name in it. The reason why you're going to do this is because in your career, you're going to use a lot of Photoshop. So if you just name it layer one, layer two, layer three, you know, like a month from now, when you have to make your portfolio, you're going to be like, oh, crap, which one is this? OK. So duplicate the layer. Uh, we're going to say uh, this duplicated layer is going to be the uh, levels edit. Just a really quick description. Even if you don't want to do that, just naming them like 01, 02, 03, 04, 05, so that when you get up to 10, it doesn't resort into, uh, that's why you start with zero. Otherwise, if you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, it'll adjust it, and it'll do 1. 10, 2, 20. It's very frustrating. All right, here we go. All right, now I'm going to work on this one. So by clicking on it, I've activated that layer. I'm going to actually turn off the other layer. You turn off the layer by poking it in the eyeball. Here, you just go ahead and put that in the eyeball. Just go ahead. Poke it in the eyeball. Oh, there we go. Thank you. It's getting a little chilly in here. All right, you guys ready for the action? Okay, L. All right, we've got some options. We can use auto levels. Ta da Doesn't really do much. Every photograph is different. The levels are going to look different. They photograph differently. If you have a drawing with a lot of line weights, it's going to look different. If you have a drawing with a lot of dark line weights, it's going to look different. I don't know whether you can tell, but do you guys see how that happened already? So we can move this around. So let's move this around until we find the sweet spot. So you can see like, not the sweet spot, right? Basically what we want is the paper to look as white as possible and the, the drawn lines to look as dark as possible. Okay, so different students get better in different ways at picking this out. Um, some people use this. Some people kind of do it by eye. Some people do auto. I'm going to cancel again. I'm going to show you guys how these eyedroppers work down here. 
So these eyedroppers, if we hover over them, it's default white, default black, and default mid-range. So if I click on this white eyedropper, it's basically going to say, click on the whitest part of the drawing. So I'm going to, rather than just trying to pick it, I'm going to just kind of click around. And it's going to, come on, we can, oh. Oh, it didn't, it didn't like that. It's going to dynamically kind of select, oh, oh, my computer's starting to crash. Hang on, we got to close Chrome. Come on, you, you know you want to do this. You got it. Dude, it's crashing. All right, let me explain what should happen. We're gonna grab this eyedropper. We're gonna put it over here onto like a white part of the drawing. What you're gonna see is, is that this part of the drawing is actually a slightly different shade of gray. This We're gonna kind of adjust that. We've got the black eyedropper. We're gonna zoom into one of the darkest pieces of line. We're going to set it as the black one. What that's going to do is going to it's going to change the frame here, give us even more information, and it'll allow us to edit a little bit more. So, so let me zoom in. Control L. Previews on. Okay. There we go. Just had to catch up. So you guys see how it's changing here? And I can kind of move, look at, look at this. So I can move my way around the drawing. So I don't know whether you guys can see it. It's a lot more apparent on my computer screen, but the highlight, you see how there's still gray down here? So we actually don't want to pick the whitest part of the drawing. We want to pick the shadow and say, use this part. Now, do you see how, as I move around, we're kind of losing some of the gray light lines. So as with all things, when we're hand drawing, I tell you guys to sneak up on the line weights. When we're digitally drawing, we're gonna do the same thing. One of the reasons why in this class, unlike the other biz classes, we're gonna do digital and hand is because the, rule, the same rules apply. Sneak up on the line weight. Now, I want you guys to keep your eye on the pictogram and look at how it changes. It's doing it again. It's, it's got the hiccups again. Come on. You were doing you're doing such a good job. There we go. Do you guys see how it changes? And see how it has those lines in it? It basically means it's cutting out a ton of data from the file. So this started out as a 10 megabyte file. We're actually bringing it down to like nine megabytes, eight megabytes, because we're we're cutting out information. So instead of saying that there is thousands of pixels with different color information, we're saying there's hundreds. This is not gonna completely make sense to you until later in your design career. I wanna expose it to you to, I wanna expose you to it today so that you're familiar with it when you hear it in Viz 2. All right, now we're gonna zoom in for the black. This is more important and we're gonna go to we're going to start off with the blackest blacks, but you can see that we can actually start with, like we can adjust the line weights. Like I could go over to here and be like, make those dark. And we'll get this really kind of Now I could go in and clean that up, but that's a lot of work. I don't want to do that. So let's just go into the darkest part of the drawing, that arrow and snag it. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to keep working our way around the drawing until we can see as much of the line weight as possible. Now, we're always gonna be making a compromise, right? So I might actually grab some of these darker lines here. So you guys see, I'm just kind of like moving in and out, in and out, trying to figure out what works best. Too much crud, not enough, not enough good stuff. There we go. So I, I think I think we're in a good spot where we we found kind of a, a happy medium. Now there's no way to ever get the drawing absolutely perfect. There's always some more work that you're going to need to do. We just took a really long time to do this. With practice, you can do this in about thirty seconds. Okay. 
With even more practice, you can do this in like 15 seconds. So usually when I'm editing an image, I'll do that in a little bit. I'll just do an image without explaining what I'm doing. And I'll just go through it really quick. See, it seems like it takes a long time. It doesn't. The reason why I'm showing you guys how to do this is because it actually takes way longer to do it on your phone. Also, since the screen is this big, it takes even longer and you don't, you don't know the full details of what it is that you're doing. Also, if I found this out the hard way, if you're editing pictures at night on your phone, if night mode turns on, it gives a yellowish hue to your pictures. So you might adjust them and then you post them to Instagram and you're like, why is everything blue? Or you're in a dark room. Like I really, I usually, I used to edit photos. My wife would be like, you should come to bed. Just work, work, you know, just like, at least just sit here while I fall asleep. So she's falling asleep. I'm editing photos. Night mode turns on. I'm in a dark room looking at a bright screen. And the next day I look at the images and I'm like, why are these all so messed up? And it's because my eyes had adjusted to the space that I was in. So, okay. We're going to say, okay. Now, check this out. One of the reasons why we had the difference. Uh, JJ, poke it in the eyeball. Ready? Hello. See the difference? Hey. Have you guys seen that? Projects and like them up? Have you put them on Miro? Have you had to load them up? Like little like, this is what the project looks like. Here's some images for the process book. No? No? Everybody used to print out their images on paper and it used to look like that. It's like, here's the picture that I took of my drawing. Actually, even worse, it used to be like at an angle. And it was just like, see, see, professor, I did it. This looks better, right? It's so much better. Same drawing, no change in the labor, just presented better. Okay, let's do a little cleanup, shall we? If you guys can tell, I get really anxious about making mistakes. And the thing that I like about working digitally is the safety net that it provides. So we're gonna call this the cleanup. We're gonna call this cleanup time. I'm gonna turn these off and we're gonna go into cleanup time. So in cleanup time, we could do a couple of things. Uh, we could chop out all of this cred right here by just like control X like that, right? So I could take all of this, all this grossness and just cut it out. Now, one of the problems is, can you guys see? Can you start seeing the little corners that I'm getting? Now, if my drawing is mostly made up of squares, like this one is, and I drew carefully, I could actually do that. And it actually kind of, look at that. It brings the line, see how it brings the line back? Oh, hey. Okay, that's not that's not too bad. It's not too bad. But you can see like where we're getting in with the triangles, that's gonna start to take some more time. So let me just really quickly snag this oop. And then can you see like this line wasn't parallel? So it's not the it's not this, it's just not the same. So if I get into a funky situation, I could go over here to this lasso and I could literally cut it out by doing this and using so I can cut out my own shape. That's not so bad either, but let's just zoom out. That's gonna take a long time to do on this entire drawing. I really don't wanna spend that much time doing that. Where it's really important to do it is at the corners. So I'm gonna turn this back on. So. Do you guys see how taking off the corners? Right now, you can still see. So here's all the things I cut out. So right now, you can still see that it's a picture of a rectangular thing. And what we really wanted to look at is like, if you open up like a design book and you see the plans and they just seem like they're floating in white space, that's nice because then instead of focusing on a picture of a picture, you're looking at the design itself, not, a, not the, the way that it's represented. So if I cut out the corners, like I've done here, it stops looking like this, where there's all this junk, and it just kind of, right, we're focused on the plan. Now, let's zoom in over here. 
see that gross corner right there? But then there's this like topography line and it's a little pixelated. So what I could do is I could either paint with white, I could erase it, or I could use what's called a layer mask. I'm not gonna show you guys how to use a layer mask today. Layer mask is my preferred way of doing it because a layer mask, you can always back up, but we're just gonna use the eraser tool. Um, most of the time, I never use the eraser tool to the point where I'm like, where is the eraser tool? Ah, fun fact. Fact that is fun. Okay, any of these tools over here on the left-hand side, if they got a little triangle, if you click and hold, it'll show you more tools that it can use. If you've used Adobe before, you're like, no crap. Hang on, I'm hunting for the eraser tool. Here it is. All right, so here's the eraser tool. Uh, I'm just gonna get a regular eraser and you can see like this is gonna be bam like that and it's gonna cut with a really hard edge. So rather than chopping off with a really hard edge like that, I'm gonna chop it off. I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna say, all right, listen, I would like, I would like it to be uh, softer, smaller. And if you guys have used Procreate and you understand like changing around the brushes to make them thicker and wider, it's the same thing we're doing here. So now it's smaller and you can see it's got a little bit of a soft edge. So what I'm gonna do here is just kind of come in, clean these up, and just kind of erase this. And I can kind of, again, I'm doing that thing where I sneak up on it. I'm gonna go up here, uh, North Arrow, kind of weird. Uh, anybody have, okay. Anybody have horrible handwriting? Anybody an awful speller? Okay. <laughs> anybody combine those two to just be like an amazing super villain of their own drawings? Yeah, okay, me too. Check this out. So we're gonna do this. We're gonna erase that right there like that. And instead, new layer, layer, new layer. All right. And instead, what we're gonna do, da -da, second or man. Hang on. Switch to black. Maybe not 60 point font, maybe 14 point font. Hang on. Do do do. Bold switcher, do it Swiss. Hey, bud. Wait, where, where are you? Where are you? There we go. Second floor. All right, so we're going to do a little bit of that. Grab all that. Uh, make it not 48 points. There we go, how about 12, how about 10? Um, this way, when we realize we misspelled it, we can go back to the original drawing. You know, and then how many people have done this, right? Where you like put it in a random place and you're like, can't you make that line up somewhere? I'm like, yes, I can, just like that. All right, what if we accidentally erased something? All right, I'm gonna go back to cleanup time. Do you guys see how we have this triangle here with the number two? So you guys already know that we can come in and do this and say number two. And we can put that right there, but obviously we have a problem. That triangle is not big enough and it's not complete, right? So I'm gonna go back to cleanup time and I'm gonna grab that triangle, copy paste. So that's control, you guys know, copy, control C, paste, control V. It's the same in Adobe, okay, good. All right, moving on. All right, so we're gonna clean up this triangle. Boop, 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 boop. Control X, take that weird number two out. And we're gonna make, we're gonna fix this. Copy, paste. Let's fix a little bit of that there. A little rotation on it, like that. Fly, put that out. Hey, we've got a full on triangle. And it's drawn with the same hand that we had here before. Now two layers, we're just going to merge these two layers. We're gonna name this, thank you. We're gonna name this 
triangle of power. Okay. And we're going to move this over to here. Control T makes it a little bit bigger. Put it on top. A little bit bigger still. There we go. Do you want to apply this transformation? Yes, I want to apply this transformation. And then we're going to go back to cleanup time and we're going to erase the number two that's underneath it. Wham. Check it out. Okay, maybe that triangle is a little bit large. All right. But I don't know. I think it's better than what we had before, which was kind of like, right, it was kind of chopped off. We could, if we really wanted to, we could go in. You, let's say we really hated that triangle. You could literally doodle a triangle, take a picture of it, and then put it in that one too. Andrew, there was more information that said second floor plan. Okay, Sophia, we will fix it. You're such a scoundrel. All right, so we're going to grab this line underneath here. Let's grab a little bit of a line that's right there. We're going to use that for the underline of our, I mean, we could just underline the text, but it looks nicer like that. It looks hand drawn. And uh, make it line up with that number one there. Grab that. Cool. Apply transformation. Um, oh, it also said what what kind of it said it said that it was like a certain scale. Hang on. Uh 316 scale. Um, we don't know what scale it is here because I changed it. Remember, I reduced it by no longer 316 scale. So I'm not gonna write that. But I could add arrows and other things to it if I wanted to. Oh man, I could do layer, new layer. Now, I know this is falling water. Anybody been to falling water? All right, I've been there and I know a couple of things about it. So let's do a diagram overlay. Check this out. So we could do, for example, I know this is the sun's room. So we could, we could, snag that and we could say we're going to make the sunroom sun's room uh, that color and uh, I know that this is his private bathroom so we could make it uh, that color and then this is the mother's room so the mother and father have separate rooms in this house you can read into that whatever you want uh, that purple. We'll do another one here and that there. Oh, nope, that's the bathroom to the other the purple. There. And then another bedroom. We'll make this orange. It's a horrible shade of orange. It's a better shade of orange. So we're basically just making kind of a use diagram for the different areas that different people are using here. Okay, we have a pretty ugly diagram right now. Um, but if I go over here and reduce the transparency, oh, not so, not so bad. If I go in here and uh, just clean it up a little bit using my... Uh, Control X, Control X, Control X. Now it's starting to look like a little like poche. Make Carol Herman happy. Have poche in your drawing. That's right. I said it. She makes fun of me because I don't like poche and I make fun of her because she likes poche. It's just how we roll. But anyway, you can start to clean up the drawing and now you have a colored plan. Now I'm doing it fast and kind of silly, but you could do lots of other fun things with it if you wanted to. Um, since it's on its own layer, right? If Carly's like, I don't like that, Andrew, I would choose different colors. I'd be like, fine, I take it away. Uh, or you could say, I wanna choose different colors and you could go over here to image mode 
no adjustments. Here we go. And we could do uh, hue saturation and you could say, okay, fine. You want a different hue? You want it more saturated? So I could kind of change colors that'll kind of like work with each other in terms of the, their opposition on the color spectrum by moving that around. Or we could just have a disco party. All right, I'm gonna turn that back off. So now we've edited that image. Now, I told you guys I would show you how it happens, but faster. So let me do that now. I'm gonna go over here, uh, back to, okay, I'm gonna go back here. So let's say I wanted to edit uh, this. I'm gonna edit this drawing because it's more broken. Copy. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna be quiet. I'm gonna I'm gonna be quiet. Uh, let's see, eighteen by twenty four, one fifty. All right, I'm just do the talking to myself that I usually do when I'm working on stuff. Control V, Control T for transform. Make it bigger, so I'll fix it later. Enter levels. Too much. No north arrows on a section. There's never north arrows on a section. I don't know why you would do that. Dumb. I got button. There we go. There we go. I'm done. I'm actually leaving in some of the gray here. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe I'll adjust this just a little bit more. I'm leaving in some of the gray to kind of, you know, emulate being the um, the texture of the drawing just a little bit. Um, and then I'm gonna I'll just show you guys. I'll do a different I'll do a different version uh, right now here where we just clean this up completely. Okay, and this is where I'm gonna show you guys how to use the magic wand tool. So here's the magic wand tool and here's the mistake that everybody makes. They just use the magic wand, they click it and then they do control cut and it looks like nothing has happened. Or they'll come in and they'll grab something and they'll do control cut 
and it'll look like that and you'll get all of this like weird like fungal growth and that basically shows i'm a beginning designer student and i love i love using magic wand tool and actually because those line weights are pretty dark that ain't, that ain't too shabby but if you look down here oh disgusting what you want to do with magic wand tool is actually say this is not what i want what i want is you don't grab the whole thing what you do is you grab the magic wand and you right click and you say color range and you're like i want all of these grays here and then you take it out and now it still looks like crap but you go in and you can cut these out now thank you you've selected nothing and erase it a little bit and see i i know it's there okay the soft edge on this brush larger softer Just gonna get away, get most of the junk out of here, and then I'll come back in and I'll work on it by hand a little bit more. This is in case I f up, I can back up. But if I do it all in one go, I'm not gonna be able to back up. So let's see if I go like this, a chew, and I mess something up, I can back up over here in the history. By using that soft edge, I can sneak up on that line without really killing it too much. Oh, yep. That was about that was that was messed up. There we go. Get in here a little bit better. And then I can go back into this. Grab that, edit. Uh, we want to feather the selection. Well, you haven't used feather in a long time, have you? You forgot where it is. Select. Mm, do we want to grow it? Yeah, grow it a little bit. Nope. Okay, there we go. Yep. All right. So now it's looking slightly cleaner. Yeah, there we go. I'm still not still not super pleased with that filter. Okay. So this another thing that happens to me on the regular, and it really should happen to anybody that's working on this, is that you forget where something is. So I've forgotten where the feather command is, probably because it's moved. So you just go over here, you either hit F1, you go to the Adobe forums, or you hit the spy tool here, and you say feather, and it says it's in select modify feather. There we go. So select modify feather. There it is. Feather, five pixels. OK. Control X. There we go. OK. So now I'm already, I'm, you know what? I'm even happier with this version. So here's the one I did before really quickly. Here's the one that I have now. That one works a lot better. There we go. Now, let's look at the previous version. That's the previous version. And the version we have now. Previous version and the version we have now, right? So much better. Same photograph. Same photograph. Looks so much better. All right. So your homework is to do that to all of the layers that you drew, every single one. Now it's gonna feel like, oh my God, that's so much work to do. Be but it, and it kind of is because you have to practice it, all right? Now there's a couple of mistakes that people will get in. You will kind of mesmerize or hypnotize yourself by grabbing what's called the um, polygonal lasso over here and like working your way around all of these. All right, now if you're doing like an inside curve, you can't really put, like you can't take the circular brush and go on the inside curve. That's why you saw me, I kind of selected it here and then I went to, uh, I've already forgotten where it is. Edit, no, transform, layer, edit, image, it was modify. Select, modify, feather. So if you feather, it actually kind of like fuzzies out the edge. I'll show you what I mean. 
So it fuzzies out the edge here. Oh, let's do that again. So if I cut that out, can you guys see right here? See how you can't quite see where that edge is? I feathered it by a distance of five pixels. If I don't feather that edge, there, can you see how it's a harder edge now? All right. So a lot of this you learn through the experience of experimenting with it. So the reason why we have created, so, and also by creating layers. Do you guys see how I didn't try to do any of the edits in one layer all by itself? Everything I did, I kept duplicating the layer. So anytime I wanted to try something new, I duplicated the layer. And then we had JJ poke it in the eye to get rid of it, right? Which this is not a touch screen, but it makes it more memorable for them. Um, but basically what I do is I just duplicate a layer again and again and again so that I can try out those versions. So that if I, if I F up, I don't feel bad about it. I'm just like, oh, I learned stuff, okay? That's, that's the important thing. Now, you can do this homework on your own computer. You can do this homework on a lab, any lab, any computer on campus, except the library. Don't use the library. The library computers are slow as crap and you don't wanna use them. You could technically finish your project on the computer in the library, but you're gonna be angry and everybody who needs to write a paper is gonna be angry at you. So just don't do that. Um, the labs are here in the middle room. In search, there's two labs upstairs. If you go upstairs and you go up the stairs and make a left towards the bathrooms, there's a lab at the end of the hall. If you make a right away from the bathrooms, there's a lab on the right, just past the little lollipop table. If you go into A and D, where we usually have class, there's a lab that's like actually right next to the studio there. It's, there's two red doors. The lights are usually off, but you can go in there. And there's also, if you go upstairs on the other side of the faculty offices, for some reason it gets locked a lot, but there's a lab in that little metal part, that little metal square kind of adjacent to the ramp. Um, there's also a lab in Smith House, but I don't recommend it because the computers over there are kind of, eh. So the homework is to do this cleanup that we've just done to this drawing on all of your layers, all of them that you've made. On Tuesday, we'll have class back here with our laptops. And what I'm gonna show you guys, so briefly earlier, I did some edits, right? Where I was using lines that already existed. So check this out, once you've gotten some lines, we can start doing other things like we can make our own drawing. So for example, so I can, oh, interesting, okay, edit, copy to, So these lines are from a different drawing. But once I have handmade lines, I can actually start grabbing them and using them for other things. So for example, I've made some rocks down here. Now that I've made some rocks, I can make more rocks. So I was like, oh, I kind of like those rocks. I'm gonna make some more rocks. I'm gonna adjust those rocks and make them to be bigger rocks. And these rocks are gonna automatically look like they fit with the other rocks because I drew them with those rocks. And now I can take the eraser tool. So this is a preview of what we're gonna do next week. So do you guys see how I just made the drawing bigger? In five seconds. So once you start making drawings and you get them cleaned up and we can actually start grabbing them. And the nice thing is, I was like, do you see how this goes with that? Because it's the same person that did the same drawing. Like this was not drawn by me, this was drawn by another student, but we can basically continue to make this student's drawing look like something. Um, now, obviously you, 
if we do this, like you guys can pick out that like one of these things looks like the other one, right? But what we can also do is kind of change up its size a little bit and then it makes it a little harder to check out. If I do this, so if I change it a little bit, right? It makes it a little bit harder to see. Can you guys tell that this is a copy of this? It's a little bit harder to see that. So, because I'm, I stretched it and I flipped it and I moved it around. Basically, I just made some more rocks by making more rocks. Uh, a really valuable way to do this is with trees, furniture, repeated textures, textiles. Let me say that again, textiles. Are you guys done with the textile project? Oh no, it's gonna come back. Oh yeah, they just did. So if you know, <laughs> if you know Photoshop, so a couple of you were trying to transfer your textiles. A couple of you were like, when you, you showed me the drawings that you had where you were like exaggerating their colors and stuff. Uh, a bunch of you had to make the textile into three-dimensional layers by slicing it into layers. We could put, you could literally take what you're doing in this class and apply it to what you're doing in the studio. And you could do it more, faster, better. The other thing that I really like is Look at all of the different layers that we experimented with, right? Like we have all these other versions and they're here, they're right here. Like I don't have to like choose, to, I don't have to erase anything. You guys all know that I don't like erasing anything, but I can just turn it off. Okay, last thing that I need to do, file save as. As you're working in Photoshop, chances are you're watching YouTube, listening, watching Netflix, you've got something on in the back. You have your email on as well, okay? Chances are that happens. Now, here's my recommendation. If you're working in AutoCAD or Illustrator or you're working in um, Photoshop, open Netflix on this thing and put it next to you. Plug this into that so that it's powered, but don't watch it in the background. The reason is, is that Netflix and YouTube are gonna be using your video processor. And this uses your video processor too. So you'll actually, your computer will run cooler, faster and more stable. It's not like your computer can't do it, but you're gonna like, after a while, like I notice when Photoshop is lagging just because I'm, I use it so much and with so many layers that I notice when other things are on. Like, remember I told you, I'm like, oh, my computer's crashing. They're not crashing. I could feel it slowing down because my email was checked. My email checks its inbox every 15 minutes. And that's what was happening. So I, I, I can tell the difference and I want to work at the speed I want to work at. The other reason is just because I find that like literally putting entertainment on a different screen that I can like move over here or move behind helps me focus and I don't have to share screen space. Like I want my Photoshop to be as big as possible so that I can look at it. I'm constantly zooming in and zooming out. The last reason is because every once in a while, Every once in a while, if you're watching like HBO Go through a web browser, it crashes or it hangs up or it slows down. And when it does that and your file crashes, you have a very bad day, right? So here's what you want to do. For our class, this is the naming convention. The naming convention is always this. Two numbers for the year. Two numbers for the month. Two numbers for the day. My birthday. Anyway, then last name, first name, brief description of what it is. Okay, here's why. You guys are about to embark on four or five years of generating Photoshop files. Okay, if you search for what you made in November, that's going to be fine until welcome to second year. And then all of your first year stuff is gonna start popping up in your second year work. And it's so annoying. So name it year, month, day. And the reason why you should do this is like, I'm really bad at this. I'm just like, open, open latest, open latest file, right? And then you open the wrong file. But then of course, that's the latest file that you open. So it's at the top of the stack and then you lose what you're working on latest. If you have it by here, you can always search documents, check this out. So I can say cancel, find, open. So I can search documents, I can bring this up and I can say this PC, search this PC, 19, 11. And it's gonna show everything that I did 
in 2011 in November. You guys are eventually going to be four years out and you're going to want to search for something that you did in second year that was really cool. You're not going to want to go through every single file that you generated in second. You guys have seen how much work the second year students are doing. Do you know how many digital files they have? Like hundreds. So the other reason to put your name on it is that chances are you guys are going to do something that's cool. And when you do something that's cool, I'm going to want to put it in the gallery. And I'm going to give it to somebody and they're going to print it out. And they're not going to put your name on it. And that's going to stink because you deserve to get credit because I want to, you know, we walked around and I was like, do you guys see, look at this picture that Ivy did when she was a freshman. I want to be like, check out what Adela did when she was a freshman. But if your name isn't on there, your name isn't going to go on there. So for example, design two white background, this student who volunteered their picture to me didn't put their name on it. So now I've been using it as an example and I should be giving them credit because it's a nice drawing. And I can't because I don't know what their name is. So file, save as, year, year, month, month, day, day, last name, first name, brief description. Okay. And then save it like that with the layers as a Photoshop file. Couple of suggestions while you're working on your homework. Do each layer individually. Take a picture of that layer free of everything else behind it. So don't untape it, but take a white piece of Bristol paper and put it underneath the piece of trace development that we have, and then take a photo of it, okay? I've already asked you guys to take those photos and kind of edit them in your, in your camera for today, which means, and the reason why I asked you to do that is so that you can get started on this if you have questions, cool. If you don't have Photoshop on your computer, we can set you up in the lab and you can work on it. We have like 45 minutes, so we can actually do some work and ask some questions. Um, but the other reason why I had you edit it in your phone is because it's, since it's your first time doing it, it just kind of simplifies it. If you, if you've done a little bit of the editing in your phone, you've made your life a little bit easier in Photoshop. Once you've practiced and you're more confident in working in Photoshop, you don't need to edit them in your phone. You can just take a, take a good quality picture and go into it. Um, another tip when you're working on your, when you're, when you're taking a picture, if the picture that you have of the layer is bad, it's faster to take the picture again under better conditions than to try to fix a crappy picture, All right? So if you're working on it and it just seems to be a bad picture, like it's really gray or it's really muddy, or the, if you're doing the like saturation thing to look at the file like I was showing you and it doesn't work, you're gonna be better off just taking another photograph, all right? The, the, the quickest, easiest shortcut for this homework is taking good photographs of the layers. So that that very first piece. Um, I will not, I can't tell you how many students I've seen where they're like, they basically are using like a really crappy picture and they're spending all this time doing really advanced Photoshop on it. Basically, you know, trying to put lipstick on a pig. Like it just doesn't work. <laughs> you wanna start with a much better picture of the pig, then it's very easy to put lipstick on it. But if you, if you start with a dirty pig, it's just always going to be a dirty pig. Um, for Tuesday, what I want is a Photoshop file. with all, Once you edit all of those layers and you have them saved as separate files, you're going to bring them in as their own layers. So check this out. We can, we can do this. Once I have this over here, right? So I have this piece. I have it all together the way that I want it. I have it all cleaned up. I'm actually going to turn all this other stuff off. All right, so here it is. I have it as its own piece. This is this is kind of what all your layers are going to look like. So you guys are going to have like, I don't know, like 20 layers to edit for Tuesday. Okay. Once you do that, on Tuesday, we're going to come in. We're going to open up your layers. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to show, this is a preview. This is a preview. Don't do this for homework. What I'm going to show you guys how to do is we're going to use the, the Spider-Man tool. All right. So right click, color range. And the reason why I'm saying don't do that, I just want to show you, I just want to show you guys this. Okay, so we're All right, there's two ways to do this. One way is to select the paper and remove the paper from the ink. The other way is to select the ink and remove the ink from the paper. Um, we're going to try it this way. Nope, 
didn't work. All right. It's always wrong the first time. Alright, wait for it. Color range. Okay, here we go. Wait for it. Wham, here we go. And ah, okay. I'm, I'm a little out of practice, evidently. All right, we're gonna make it really fuzzy. We're gonna do it this way. Cut, ah, you, hang on. It takes finesse to get this right. Fuzziness. There we go, got it. Paste. Okay. Evidently, Andrew needs to practice this because he's rustier at it than he thought to. Thought he was. Okay, let me describe to you what I'm trying to do. What you can do, what you can do, is with the magic wand you can say select all the graphite of the paper. Now imagine that you could physically do this. Imagine that you could, we could pinch the graphite that Lydia has drawn, and carefully pull all of it off of the paper keeping it all connected together. And then that's what we can do with this. And it's really, it's really, um, there's two ways to do it. Either you select the paper and then you say, okay, I don't want the paper. There we go, like this, select, there we go. Now we're gonna get it. And like I said, each drawing is different. There we go. See how it looks like the drawing is gone? It's gone. There, it's back. All right, wait, but I'm not done yet. All right, we're gonna do it again. Color range. Select inverse, cut. All right, all the drawing is gone. I don't know if you guys can see this, but there's still a shadow that's there. Hang on, wait for it. Paste. Uh, we're gonna grow the canvas size just a little bit more. We're gonna do 17 by 17. Okay, so check this out. Now I can kind of make it look like check out these drawings. Okay, so I've got both of these drawings. Now here's something that you can't do. You can't take two drawings and put them in front of each other. We, we can't physically do that. We can, but if we do it, you can't see it. We could do it, we could do it with trace paper, but it would kind of block each other. Watch this. Right? But now think about what we can do with this superpower, right? We could take a picture and draw on top of it. We could draw lots of different ones. We could even generate new layers with the old drawings that we already have but we can also make composite drawings. So let me just share with you guys. There's some really famous graphics that basically show these kind of composite images. I don't know, what, what is the difference that you guys see from a drawing presentation like this versus a drawing presentation like this? It's like here, each of the four drawings is presented as its own drawing independently. You know, they're, they're, they're shown together, but it's almost like, um, 
I don't know. This is like, to me, this is like flipping through a yearbook where there's a picture of each person just kind of like, <laughs> right? I, I don't know. Maybe you guys like looking through that, but like, I think those are like the most static pages of a yearbook, right? They're like these like mug shots and they're not like people being themselves, right? Whereas think about a favorite picture that you have, of like you and your family members or you and your friends, right? It's probably not even where you're like all aligned for the proper selfie, right? It's like, you know, those like candid pictures that somebody has of you where they're like, you just capture that moment, right? It's not like posed. You're just like, hey, and everybody looks over and you're like, click. I think this is the design version of that, right? Where you get that moment. There's something that I get about seeing like a perspective and a plan and a texture all together. It's like so much more special than other stuff, right? So again, this is just a preview of where we're heading, okay? The homework, the homework is just to edit those layers. Andrew, you're doing that thing where you're cutting in our, our work, I know. Tools, size. So check this out. This is a, so, so I want to show you guys some, some um, kind of graphics. Here's one of my favorite architectural drawings. It's from the nineties and I think it's impressive because it is digital, but it's using like really ancient computers. It's a big file. It's gonna take a while to open. All right, so this is a perspective sketch model plan drawing all at once. Let's see if we can open it in a new tab. Come on, show it big. Open image in new tab. So tiny. I wish I could show you guys this to you big. Too many, too many, too many things going on here. Uh, let's open another one. Oh, here. Flipping Pinterest. I love Pinterest for gathering things together, but it makes all the images small and you can't open them individually. There you go, check this out. Look at this. So this is a combination of a perspective, a section, um, photographs they, like this. I don't know that you guys can see this, but like instead of trying to draw, instead of trying to, instead of trying to draw um, the bookshelf, they actually just took a picture of the bookshelf and then they cut in the picture of the bookshelf. I, I don't know whether you guys think this is cool, but I, I hope you can appreciate, like it takes a long time. So they did this, they did this in like Photoshop 